You are now tuned in to the Addicted to Success.com podcast, where geniuses, entrepreneurs, and next level game changers share their juicy little secrets on achieving massive success. This is the advice you wish you heard years ago. Be prepared and take note as we expose the realness and the raw of what it takes to be successful on Addicted to Success.com. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Addicted to Success podcast. Now today, I have an amazing man who starred in the smash hit movie, The Secret. He's a successful author, and he has around three quarters of a million subscribers on his Notes from the Universe mailing list. He's Mr. Thoughts Become Things. He is Mike Dooley. Mike, welcome to the Addicted to Success podcast. Great to be with you, Joel. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, no problems. No problems. I, uh, I've been following your work for quite a while. Actually, my fiance put me onto your work. Actually, uh, she receives a lot of your notes from the universe. And it's funny, I see the notes from the universe getting shared all over Facebook. And Yay. people are saying like, oh my God, this came at the right time. Like it just, <laughs> it, it's crazy because it is like, it's the universe, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's the magic from the universe. And you, you're talented in your writing and you, you bring, like I was saying before, just before the interview, what I love about you is that you bring a lot of quality to the table. And I respect the fact that you put in the hard yards with each note because it's great quality. And uh, I don't know, man, where do you get all that creativity from? Uh, Well, thank you very much, Joel, for all of that. And thanks to your fiance, too, for the nod. Um, Where does it come from? Well, in the beginning, I found out that I had it to give when I was at the bottom of the barrel. Um, I guess like so many success stories, you know, that comes about or it came about for somebody when they kind of crashed and burned. And 15 years ago, I was, I mean, it wasn't really that bad. Uh, You know, I lived in a great home and had friends, but I had no rudder, no direction, no tunnel to look for a light down and, and was kind of desperate and scared that if I didn't figure out my life at 39 years old, man, it was just passing me by. And I used to think then and my sleepless nights that, you know, maybe the best is behind me. You know, maybe this is the way it goes. I kind of lucked out with two careers early on that took me all around the world and a lot of, you know, uh, money and status and stuff. And it's like, maybe this is just the way it goes, you know? And I was like, no, I can't let that be true. But I couldn't see how my life could ever take off again. I mean, there was just nothing. Um, so out of desperation, I kind of, I, I, what I tell audiences to do now, you know, I assessed my sucky paths and I chose the least sucky and I just (laughs) went and having programmed life's magic as I teach through our thoughts, becoming things with end results, you know, a big rocking life without worrying about how I'm going to get there, you know, laughing, surrounded by friends in abundance. Uh, that program is the magic. And then showing up. And it doesn't matter what you do. Anything is better than nothing. You become a lightning rod. The, the miracles are going to reach you. And things will turn around in ways you cannot now fathom. And that didn't seem like it was working for me. <laughs> but, you know, it seems like it's taken forever when it's when it's you and you're waiting for your your, you know, star to rise. It's like it feels like it's not rising. And then one day you're like, oh my God, I'm living the life of my, I'm living beyond my wildest dreams. And it's like, when did this happen? It's like yesterday, things were kind of sucky and you can't find a day on the calendar where it went from sucky to great. But uh, the point is it was the slow metamorphosis and that means at any point in that metamorphosis, had you given up hope because it seemed like nothing was working, you would have not realized you had already crossed the tipping point towards your inevitable success. And, and that's, the way, that's the way it goes. You program it with these dreams, prepare to be astounded, show up on the least sucky path, just that you're available is what's most important. And then you discover creativity, you discover insight, you have the, the bright idea, uh, and things are transformed. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful, Mike. I love that. And it is funny, like it's, it, people see it as overnight success, but it's not, it's not like that. There are so many hard yards that you have to put in, right? There's a saying of, uh, uh, they only see the glory, but they don't see the story, right? Oh, that's good. I never heard that. 
Yeah, actually, our mutual friend uh, David T. S. Wood shared that with uh, with me once. So, oh, brother Wood. Yeah, that's great to hear. <laughs> Beautiful. It's true. My gosh, it's true, and it's sad that people don't want to hear the story or they don't really feel the story because in the end it's the story not the glory that's like so memorable and so meaningful and i think i'll look back with the most fondness when i'm getting my life review from another realm and i see that you know checking out what mike dooley did good bad and otherwise you know it'll be those quiet moments alone where i was kind of digging deep inside feeling like I was accomplishing nothing, but actually just doing the best I could with what I had um, that I will be proudest of. Not not the, the, the glory. The glory is like, what's the destination? The destination makes the journey possible, but in the end, it is the journey, and you're like the, so grateful for and so in awe of, which does not speak badly of destinations. I'm all for glorious destinations. Um, but uh, but it's the journey now in the middle of it and in hindsight that we we feel such fondness for. Mm, wonderful, wonderful. Now, I know that you're a, a big believer in signs and also the universe having your back. So <laughs> <laughs> looking looking back at when you first started uh, notes from the universe, what signs and like little nudges did you receive? back then from the universe that you believe is really inspired? Um, well, I, I believe in in the, the, the magic and the metaphysics of life. Metaphysics sounds like a new agey word. It just means the physics, the science that makes other sciences possible, it makes possible chemistry, biology, meta, before. Um, signs per se, oh, you know, I... I usually tell people, be careful if you're looking for signs, and, and, and the fact that you are is maybe a sign in and of itself that the answer is within and not outside of you. Um, but I will say along the path, the path that I've walked hand in hand with the universe and these metaphysical principles that I teach so much about, um, there's that inner guidance system of our intuition and our emotions. And I often joke about you know, the suck paths I started out on, one of which was speaking at you know, Toastmaster clubs. And I hated the speaking, um, but I would not only speak at Toastmasters, I would call up Rotary clubs and I would get invited to Rotary clubs. And then I would speak at Unity churches because they're open to you know metaphysical talks. And I hated every step of the path and people will say well why did you stay with it you know if it was you know 18 months of you know nerves and nausea making yourself speak in public and the answer is there was a, a bigger feeling inside of me that you know i had something to say i still have something to say uh i want to say it and i don't have a preference whether it's written or spoken or sign language or whatever but because my life is in a shambles seemingly i'm going to show up in every area where people will listen or people will read and if one of those areas scares me to pieces uh unless something else comes along if i've got the time how could i not at least show up there and i used to tell my mom you know kind of curse in front of my mother, like, you know, when is my life going to take off? I hate speaking. Uh, this is, where's the universe that I write about? This is many, many years ago, 10, uh, no, 12, 14 years ago in the beginning of the journey. Um, but, but it was because I stuck with it, even though, even though it felt like it was going nowhere, I had a deeper sense. And I think everyone listening or watching right now has a deeper sense that you know these metaphysical principles exist. You know there's a power to positive thinking. You know there's a law of attraction. You know you are awesome. You are worthy. You are powerful. Uh, and even though this, the path may not reveal that in the moment, your inner senses do and you sense it. You, 
you suspect it. And while you can't explain the crap you're going through or the bad turn you took or the chaos that's happening, you can nevertheless explain the nature of reality, that you're born to thrive, that you have these default settings inside of you to succeed right now. And so go to those feelings, those bigger than life feelings. And while they may seem small, but yeah, my life doesn't bear them out. Yeah, it doesn't seem to make sense. It's like if you want change bad enough, you're going to focus on what's good about your, your, your inner compass. And you're going to get yourself out of bed and you're going to show up even though it sucks. And you're going to write the second, third, fourth, and 20th speech, even though the first 19 didn't pay Jack. Because there's this feeling, and that's the answer to your question. It's like the sign, if you will, or the indicator, if you will, that that um, you're on the right path is just like, I just know there's something here. And so you just do your best with what you got um, as you approximate finding that something there until it is shows up so big you just can't no one can miss it <laughs> <laughs> i love that michael i love that you're so uh so real with it that you said that you know you were saying these things and going against what you were putting out in the beginning because at the start it always seems like such a struggle right and yeah. you were doing the hard things you were you were in the trenches because you saw the bigger vision you saw where you could go with it you were uh, expanding on your skill set what would you say is now your definition of success after you know doing these hard yards and seeing the bigger picture and being part of a bigger vision that you were chasing for so many years? What is your definition yeah. of success now? For me, in hindsight, when there's been a destination that inspired a journey that was scared and spooky and mysterious along the way, and then you've kind of arrived, it was the whole process of being in motion towards something great. And I, I would say people will define success or happiness. Or For me, it's in your terms, your show's terms, you know, I'm addicted to the process. I'm addicted to being in motion towards something. And sometimes I couldn't define that something. But, but inevitably, it would involve some form of creativity, becoming more, being more, and going where I've never been before. That's my idea of success. Yeah, beautiful. It's the process. It's the journey. It's enjoying the ride, right? Totally, totally. And that, when you've done it, you realize that, you know, because because to so many that's a cliche. Enjoying the journey. And I've been saying that already in this program, and and you've just uh, said it as well. And it it can be kind of like, you know, what the f. Life is hard and I can't figure it out. I just got laid off. I have chicken pox and my girlfriend cheated on me. It's like, enjoy the journey. <laughs> um, but when you kind of have had a journey like mine where you were really scared, you were really at the bottom of the barrel. And that's a relative thing. Other people have had it worse than me, but I, it was bad for me. And you've kind of made it all the way through to where you now are. You realize that that there wasn't a bad step or a misstep nor a mistake along the entire way. It was like everything was a gift. And I often get asked by audience members, you know, like, Mike, what do you do when you really books and everything's cool? And then, bam, you get blindsided and bad stuff happens. How do you put it back together? How do you make sense of it? But when you've been through this circuit that I've just been having, that I feel like I've been through, you realize in hindsight that there's no such thing as bad stuff. There are surprises, and, and you might feel like it was knocked out of you, or worse. But you will see that no matter what has happened to you, you will use it invariably in your unfoldment, your blooming, to become better than you even knew as you could be prior to being blindsided, and that, and therefore these you know, steps or slips on the path or circles that we sometimes fly in or run in, and they're all set ups for being greater than we knew we could be. Uh, and in fact, they showed up in a way to reveal that we were missing something. When I'm talking about enjoying the journey, it means it's like, it is all good. Even the slow moments, even the setbacks, even the pain, the slap in the face, it's all temporary. 
you're going to blast through the ceiling. You're going to make it and go beyond where you now dream of going. And when you really get that, you're like, you know, everything is a lesson. And then it's, everything is a lesson that adds to you, that, that smooths out your thinking, that reveals God in all details uh, and in all people. Everything is so great. You wouldn't change anything for anything. That's how uh, amazing our lives in the jungles of time and space are. One miracle after another. And it's life, when we pay attention, that starts proving that to ourselves. Yeah, Mike, that's such a beautiful way to look at life. Seriously, I think a lot of people could uh, learn quite a lot from what you just said. So thank you for sharing that with the audience. I love it. Love My it. great pleasure. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent, mate. <laughs> so what do you love most about the universe? Oh, wow. Um, there was a note from the universe that said, uh, you know what I like most from all things, uh, from you know, the deep blue sea to colorful rainbows to 100 million species? And the punchline was, how real it all seems, which has the undertow of it's not real. None of it's real. None of it's what we think it is. None of it's this all or nothing objective um, do or die, have or have not scenario that our physical senses tells us it is. And so what do I love most about the universe is just, I mean, the, 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 the diversity, the splendor. I'm looking out my window at the lake when you ask that question, like, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the never-ending surprises, the never-ending awe um, that I feel that it inspires. Um, and then on top of that, that, that it's, not, it's not the end. It's not reality. It's, it's an illusion created by an even, an even wiser portion of you and I, um, some part of ourself closer to source, to God, to the creative mind behind all creation, and that it'll continue going on and going deeper and going farther. I mean, what perfection. It's like impossible, painful perfection, painful in, a, in the most joyful way, but like, ow, it makes my brain hurt to think, how could it be this flipping perfect? Um, total state of all. And I have a little baby. I'm a brand new first time dad as of a year ago. And um, talk about the awe, talk about revelations, talk about. <laughs> Congratulations. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It's so incredible. That is incredible. And you look at the, like, you know, the human body and the, even how the brain works. I was watching a uh, documentary the other day about the uh, conscious and subconscious and unconscious brain. And it's just so incredible how many bites of information went downloading and filtering at every millisecond yeah oh it's it's so incredible you know how can you not be in awe of that no and then i tell audiences you know consider that the brilliance that was able to hang each star in the night sky 10 sextillion stars at a minimum that's a hundred billion times 100 billion Wow. That's how many stars at a minimum are out there, not to speak of planets. And when you think of on this one planet, there's 100 million different species. That's the intelligence that is alive in you and me right now and in every single listener or viewer right now. That's the intelligence that chose to be Mike Dooley. That's the intelligence that chose uh, the circumstances, the challenges and all else that are unfolding in my life. Not that there's destiny, but the stage which may likely hold the probabilities for such challenges and adventures. And even though I can't wrap my little brain around the depth and profundity of that knowledge and the choices involved, I can nevertheless, as all of us can, sense that it's there and know with certainty that that intelligence is what brought me 
into the jungles of time and space. So even when things seem like, you know, it sucks and today looks like yesterday and nobody loves me and it doesn't make sense. It's like lie, lie, lie. Yeah, it might look like that, but that's part of the adventure. That's part of the challenge. See beyond the lie. See beyond with your physical senses. Go beyond your physical senses and know through deduction, through connecting these dots that we just connected that that it will all make sense, that in fact, it does make sense. It's just that you or I are not connecting all the dots when we feel overwhelmed or distraught. But hang in there, because there hasn't been any mistakes. You haven't made any mistakes. And still we are spoiled and we are, uh, we've not challenged ourselves enough to go within uh, individually and collectively. But it's because it takes so little to realize <clears throat> some of the truths, Joel, that we're talking about right now, anybody can realize that they have to be of God, by God, pure God, not a God of religion, something much grander, more loving, more uh, all-encompassing than that. And when you realize you are by God, of God, for, for God, pure God, yourself, every cell in your body is divine awareness, then you can have this sense of peace that all is supremely well. Even if you can't see it, you can still know that all is well, that you haven't been forgotten, that things are uh, unfolding in ways that are serving you and all creation, and that in a moment, your life is going to be over, metaphorically, in the blink of an eye, and you will find yourself surrounded by friends, in love, metaphorically in the palm of God's hand. And since that is an inevitability, okay, now what was I complaining about? <laughs> What's on the stage of my life? Uh, and wh where do I want to focus my attention to create change? And, I, you know, I think, you know, I'm all about, um, you know, we can live deliberately. That's one of our lessons here in these illusions. And we do so by understanding that our thoughts unfailingly become the things and events of our lives. We start knowing which buttons to press thereby and which levers to pull, and we're on our way, living the life of our dreams. Yeah, that's right. I mean, every, every day when we wake up, we have the choice whether or not we want to create the day. Otherwise, the day creates itself for us. <laughs> Why wouldn't you want to create your own day? That is so true. That reminds me of two things that have been on my mind lately. Uh, I just heard on Sirius Radio, the, on this Pitbull uh, radio station, you know who he is, the, the, the rapper, singer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's like, you know, it, he, they have these quotes from him, some of which are um, very impressive. You know, he said, if you don't attack life, you know, meaning attack your dreams, live deliberately is what he meant. He said, then it's like life attacks you. And I know that my brother told me that Tony Robbins, who I admire greatly, although I don't listen to or read or know, um, used to say something to the effect of, if you don't challenge yourself, then the universe will challenge you. And it's a whole lot better when you're challenging yourself than when all of a sudden, <laughs> from the woodwork, challenges are being tossed your way. Uh, which isn't to say that the universe tests us. But if we're not challenging ourselves, then there's something we're misunderstanding about life. And when there's misunderstandings with regard to the nature of reality, that's when we trip ourselves up. That's when we get in our own way. That's when you know, the machinery starts bogging down. Um, and we can avoid that by proactively going out there, connecting dots, asking the hard questions, seeing the simple answers, reveling in the beauty, uh, the magnificence, and, and the power that we possess mm, there you go there you go mike do you often uh reflect on your life and, and look at what you're currently doing and, and think like can i do more or am i doing the best that i can do you ever think that oh my gosh i wish i would stop doing that <laughs> sometimes because <laughs> it is a for it's been a forever um it, adventure into how else could I do this? How could I do it better? How could I do it more of it? Um, to the point of, uh, I, I, I know one of my challenges and that is um, not, not stressing, like wanting more, that's okay. Going for more, that's okay. 
but chilling out as I go for it. And maybe everybody needs to learn that to a degree. But because I'm always trying to take it up a notch, my net, you know, I've got 10 books right now, and each one of them, I will admit, uh, I, I imagine in the grandest, most spectacular terms as far as, you know, selling all over the world. Uh, and each one has done really great, but never as great as I dreamed. And so it's like the next book, okay, the next book. And it's like, wow, I don't want to to be pushing myself so hard that that I miss some of the things that we've been talking about and not, uh, you know, smell the roses kind of thing. So I don't have a problem um, taking it higher, taking it higher. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Maybe you can uh, compile the amount of books that you've sold so far and just count that number instead. <laughs> yeah, I. Oh, yeah. There's always a workaround like that, and and there's always a way to realize and appreciate what you have done. You know, even if it's just touching one person through kindness. You know that that that's changed the orbit of the world, and uh, I think we need to more readily give ourselves credit for what's been done and not necessarily define it in terms of accolades or exterior recognition, you know, voices on the outside. It just needs to be that sense of peace. Like I'm in motion, as I said earlier, I'm moving towards goals and uh, I'm enjoying every step of the path. Mm. What else is there? You know, you just got... We just have today, anyhow, no matter what our destinations are, no matter what ports of call we've reached in the past, you still only have right now. And so if we can be happy right now, I'm, t I'm teaching myself in this moment, if we can be happy right now, um, even as we move to more, um, it's like game over, you know, we, we totally aced it um, because then nothing not the destination or anything else can then keep us from this moment, this this sense that we've instilled within ourselves. Mm, that's right. That's right. You know, actually, I was watching a TEDx video the other day, and there was a speaker by the name of Mike Robbins who talks about uh, acting or authentically or, or presenting yourself authentically, right? And, yes, I know, Mike. Yeah, and, and it was funny. At the end of the uh, video, he said that his mentor... I uh, gave him some advice and he said to Mike, you know, you're, you're just going through life trying to survive right now. But he said, but the thing is you, you forget nobody ever does. <laughs> it's so true. That's good. That's good. Uh, yeah. That'll make you think. Yeah. So, uh, you know, on that note, let's talk about death. Cause I know that you recently released a book uh, called the top 10 things dead people want to tell you. Yeah. So, so what do you know so far about death through your research on this subject? Well, kind of fundamental to everything that I teach is, you know, a, a call to the reader, a call to the listener of like, you know, our highest responsibility to ourselves is to ask the hard questions and realize by going within through common sense, deductive reasoning, you can have answers that will give you traction so that you can blast off. And it, it was through going within, having asked some hard questions all life long, that uh, I started getting some idea of the nature of reality, which included, you know, us prior to time and space, us living in time and space, and us living beyond time and space. And when you can kind of come up with those answers in areas that have terrified people that have um, shaken their confidence, psyched them out, um, made them less than who they really were. Uh, this is solid gold. And in fact, I was kind of going within once when I was writing a note from the universe about three years ago. And um, I forget what the point was, but the PS was, and that's, what the dead want you to know. Because it was a point about living your amazing rocking life now while you can. And the dead see so clearly what we don't see. The dead don't deal with this amnesia that we've chosen to, to have, which helps us stir passion, etc. And uh, I thought, oh, that's a really cool angle. No doubt the dead would be so eager for us to 
to get this point. And by the end of that session, that writing session, I wrote a note from the universe called the top 10 things dead people want to tell you. And I thought that'd be a really cool book title. Mm -hmm. And each of the 10 things could be a chapter. And I shared that with uh, the folks at Hay House, my publisher now. And uh, they were like, yeah, we're totally sold. Go for it. Which was like, oh, awesome. Except I had to write a book, which is a big project. <laughs> and I did. And um, it's, oh, geez, it's been uh, selling really, really well in the last six months. Um, super happy with it. And those 10 things are, let me grab the book right here. Number one, we're not dead which gives us a platform to talk about what else they want to tell us because they couldn't be doing it if they were mm -hmm. gone, gone. Number two, there's no such thing as a devil or hell. And I talk about that being the worst, greatest, most horrific conspiracy perpetrated on man, by man, to man since the dawn of time. Um, number three is they were ready to go. Uh, no matter how seemingly freakish their departure may have been or no matter how randomly seeming the accident was, um, thinking that random, pointless accidents happen uh, sets us up for such. Uh, they don't happen. There's no such thing as random. There's no such thing as pointless or meaningless. Nothing happens without order, perfection, and love. And so that chapter talks about how there can be order even amongst the chaos of someone unexpectedly transitioning, someone we love unexpectedly dying. Uh, so the book is meant to be a comfort to those who have lost someone as much as it is meant to be an inspiration for those still on the stage of life. Uh, it talks about we are, if you're reading this, you're not ready to die. Um, there's, the dead are sorry for a pain they caused. They want us to know above all that dreams really can come true, but it is up to you. Heaven is going to blow your mind, but not so much that you, uh, you need to hurry your way here because there's a line on the other side, uh, figurative of, figuratively speaking, of those, want to, those who have died and they're in these amazing, wondrous realm who want to come back here where we are. And I, I point out, look, we came from dead and we're all going back to dead, you know, which is not what we thought it was before. But that we're here is really meaningful. And in fact, it is the romance that the illusions make possible, believing in the lies of here versus there, have versus have not, now versus then, that make a lifetime in the jungles of time and space so exotic and spectacular and phenomenally precious. Uh, and then there's just a few more points. Uh, life is more than fair. People too often think it's not fair. There goes their power. Your old pets are as crazy as ever. And number 10, love is the way. Truth is the path. And so that's the book. And it's basically a work of intuition, logic, common sense. Nothing revealed is something that anyone could drill down to and deduce simply through the possession of their own wondrous, miraculous life. Yeah, yeah. Look, we've got to pick that up. If you're listening right now, make sure you, you jump on Kindle and order that book or jump on Amazon, wherever you need to go and check it out. I've heard, I've had way too many people come to me now and tell me I've got to pick up that book. So <laughs> it's definitely a, a great book to read. That's Thanks, for sure. Joel. It's dollar ninety nine right now at Amazon as a Kindle. Um, uh, yeah, I can't figure it out, but it's a good, good, good deal. So it's there for anyone interested. Dollar ninety nine, limited time at Kindle. There you go, limited time. Get it now. <laughs> so, so Mike, why do you uh, think we're here on this earth? We're here because we chose to be here. And we chose to be here. The next question is, why would we choose to be here? Because we could. Because it's awesome. Because love is everywhere. Miracles abound. Um, we wanted. I wanted to be Mike Dooley. You wanted to be Joel. The person listening is who they are because from the zenith of their brilliance, their divine mind, that's who 
they most wanted to be. Another way to phrase that is, we are each who God most wanted to be. And while some listeners right now may be like, oh, yeah, sure, you know, God would want to have this funny face, these short legs, uh, whatever, whatever, whatever. Uh, it's like, yeah, the fact, I mean, what do you think? It was a mistake? It was an accident that, that things didn't go the way God thought they would go? There's a reason, there's order, there's perfection. And when we start paying attention, we see it. And included in all of those reasons is that dreams come true. I mean, that's pop vocabulary, pop vernacular all over the world in every culture. You know, it's not just a Disney World thing. Dreams really do come true. And whatever anyone listening right now is dreaming, it can come true. And the only variable is whether or not we insist on it, whether or not we act on it. And my whole message is you can act on it fearlessly and with confidence when you understand the nature of reality. And therefore, you're not giving your power away to, well, maybe if God thinks I'm worthy, uh, the universe has its own time frame. Uh, if I wasn't a pirate in the 12th century, if I haven't entered an ancient spiritual contract that's going to rob me of my, you know, uh, thunder, it's like, you got to ask all the hard questions. They're super easy. I do it for you in all of my books. The last book alone is enough of a rock for anyone to stand on confidently, understanding the nature of reality. And then you can deliberately kind of rumble in the jungle, if you will, and enjoy this bastion of perfection, this jewel floating in space. I mean, who wouldn't want to come here when you see how awesome it really is and that the bad and scary stuff really isn't so bad and scary because in the long run, it too makes us more. It's like we're in a world right now where everything adds to us. Everything that happens adds to us and everything that doesn't happen adds to us. Everything makes us better every way and every day. But you, to understand that fully, you can't just use your physical senses, which is all else that I talk about in my books. So that's the answer. Um, we're here because we chose to be here, and we chose to be here so that we could totally rock and roll, just as we see so many people doing in their lives. That's there for all of us. Mike, you absolutely blew my mind, mate. It's 3 a.m. here in the morning, and I have to go to bed after this. I don't know if I'll be able to oh my sleep. God. <laughs> I'll be laying there thinking about all the wonders of the world and all these amazing things, and what am I doing? <laughs> Wow. Oh, wow. It. It's been an honor, Joel. Thank you so much for having me. No, that's great, mate. Excellent. So why do you think uh, people don't rock and roll? Why people don't really rock this world and don't the really The number one reason, up? and you just hit on my favorite question, so I've got the answer for you. <laughs> um, the number one reason people don't live happier, fuller, more rewarding lives is because they don't know any better. They think that life is hard, people are mean, it's all a test, God decides, and through each of those misunderstandings, they give their power away. No wonder it's hard for them to get out of bed 5 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock in the morning or when it's cold outside. It's like, oh, God, what's the point? I might not even survive the stupid day. And somebody might poke me in the eye or run into my car or give me chicken pox. But when you understand the truth, Joel, you understand that we are truly the eyes and the ears of the divine, here by choice. doesn't matter that you don't remember what led to that choice. You can know, as we talked about, that it was for beautiful reasons, that it was for majestic reasons, that, it was, that there was order and perfection involved, and, and that throughout your life, your thoughts will, as they already have, become the things and events of your life, combined with your words combined with taking action we live we live in a world i like to joke joel that's not fair the cards are so stacked in our favor it's a joke it's as if we have license to cheat all day long it's so not fair everyone and anyone can do this when they know the truth if they don't know the truth they won't believe me They'll think life is hard. They'll have a tough time getting out of bed in the morning. They'll think that they, they could choose wrong. They, they may have made mistakes. It was all for nothing. Oh, my God. That's hell. That's hell on earth. I love it, Mike. I we love can all move into world. a place of knowing and confidence. Yeah, 100%. 100%. And I love your view on the world. You know, you're, at the end of the day, 
you, you can either think it's uh, a a bad place or a good place, right? Like, what what choice is there? You go with it and and live it up, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when you realize your thoughts become things, your decision in that equation gets multiplied. Yeah. So you'll see more good or more bad, however you chose. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Now, Mike, on your site, tut.com, tut.com, check it out if you're listening yeah. right now. Uh, there's a like Q&A section, which I thought was really great. You know, So anybody that's visiting can see some of the ans- uh, questions that you're answering there from from fans and somebody asked you about uh you know in one line or one sentence what advice would you give me on like writing a book and you said only write if you have something you really want to say so i know that you're working on your next book right now so what do you have to (laughs) say on this next book well most of my works so far are are significantly about deliberate living do this to get that. The last book, uh, The Top 10 Things Dead People Want to Tell You, uh, I deviated, which gave me the opportunity to talk about other elements of reality that give readers a fuller picture. Because the more complete the picture we have with regard to who we are, how we got here, the nature of reality, the more confidence we have in living deliberately. And one of my audio programs several years ago was titled everything you ever wanted to know about life but were afraid to ask and again that was to give me license to talk about such oddities as reincarnation secret societies ancient civilizations life on other planets um etc and the the reasoning i wanted to talk about all of those extraneous things was as i just said it fills in a complete picture. And Hay House uh, likes that idea. They loved uh, the audio program. And so the next book is about everything under the sun except being a deliberate creator so that we can have a com- more complete picture and then be a better deliberate creator. So it's we've changed the title from everything you want to know about life, but we're afraid to ask. The, working, the new working title is Life on Earth earth and uh kind of a a a treatise on how we got where we are who we really are understanding here's the subtitle understanding who we are how we got here and what lies ahead so that's what i that's what i have to say next joel ah that's the exclusive i love it thanks for sharing that with us mike you're so welcome do you know when that will be out by any chance oh my gosh it's going to be the fall of next year, so like 15 months from now, because my last book's only six months old, The Top 10 Things Dead People Want to Tell You. Yeah. Okay. So I don't want to, I don't want to go too fast for people to catch up. <laughs> is, it, is it pretty typical to write, like for you as a writer, to spend like maybe 12 months or, or six months? Or not? Like how long would you usually spend writing a book? Oh, I'd say six to eight months for the first draft while at the same time I run all other aspects of my business. Like for example, I'm going to be in Brisbane in a week with Mr. David T S Wood for a week and uh, doing other such amazing things during the six to eight months. So it's not like that's all I'm doing, but I'd say that's probably kind of typical that they need a lot of lead time. Most books Because if you've got a publisher like Hay House and there's going to be a hardback version, um, everything needs to be typeset, spaced. The art needs to be agreed upon by five layers of, you know, department heads. Um, You have to do the the rollout marketing wise for the book industry. And uh, actually, this book has been planned for a couple of years. Um, Mm -hmm. But I'm just now cranking on the first draft, which is simply taking the transcript from the audio and putting it into book form while balancing the rest of my life. But pretty typical. <laughs> Story of but an anybody can do anything. <laughs> you know, you could write a book, you could write one book in six weeks if that's all you did or less um, or take six years. I'm sure people have done both. Yeah, it, it sounds like like extreme focus, right? 
not getting distracted and really focusing down on, on what totally. it is. Yeah. Totally. That's exactly right. Now I'm just wrapping the interview up with one last question. And the question is, if you were to deliver your last 30 second speech to the world, what would that last 30 seconds sound like? You are loved. You are adored. You don't have to do anything. You get to do stuff with the time that remains. So just start doing it, being who you already are, loving what you already have, and making the most of every second you have left. Ah, oh, beautiful, Mike. Oh, Thanks that a million, was pressure. Buddy. Thanks a million. I really appreciate that. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Cheers. <laughs>